What's up, guys, and welcome to the Score Esports Podcast. I'm your host, as per usual, Colin. In the booth with me, we got Daniel Rosen. Hello, emergency board technician. That's right. And Sean Wetzlar, a rare Sean Wetzlar appearance. Hello, happy to be here. Now, when Sean is on the show, guys, you know we can only be talking about one thing, and that is League of Legends. But we're not just going to be talking about it. We have a really, really exciting guest for you today. We've got Afia de Portra, and I. she's going to destroy me if I said that incorrectly. You know her better as Shox, EULCS host, interviewer. If you've seen any League of Legends, I'm sure you know uh, this talented person. So, Dan, without further ado, let's just bring her on and shut me up. Absolutely. Shox, how are you? Hello! I actually didn't do that bad of a job with my name, and also I never hold it against anyone because it is just very difficult, so no worries. Well, Shox, you have done one thing I'll say that I wish pretty much every esports personality or pro would do, which is you have a lovely video on your YouTube channel that explains just exactly how to pronounce your name. <laughs> exactly! I hope that helps. It's actually really old, so maybe I should relink that to people. Yeah, it's, it still holds up. It's still pretty good. I was watching some of your uh, Unreal Tournament highlights on that, actually. <laughs> yeah, there's a, a monster kill, I believe, from the... Because they made the new... Or, well, the new Unreal Tournament is an alpha, and it really resembles the one I used to play. Yes, there is, there is a monster kill. I definitely watched that this morning. It woke me up along with my morning coffee, so thank you for that. <laughs> now... We are going to get to present day and worlds and the EULCS broadcast team uh, a little bit later in the show. But actually, we wanted to start off, it's okay with you, with some of that ancient history, with stuff that is tied to Unreal Tournament. And I know uh, you've said in the past that your name, Shocks, is actually a reference to a weapon in, uh, in Unreal Tournament. Is that correct? Yeah, it's true. Uh, it comes from Shock Rifle. I used to play Instagib Capture the Flag 5v5. Uh, in Unreal Tournament 1999, so a very long time ago, and Shocks. I then added like a J because I guess it's it was edgy or whatever. It's kind of Dutch or like my mother tongue, but it's supposed to be Shocks from Shock Rifle. It looks really cool, and uh, I definitely remember playing with the Shock Rifle Instagib Zero Gravity. It was it was a blast. Um, that's, oh, you zero gravity. That's even harder. Yeah. It's just it's just so much fun in that game. That's that's one of my favorite games of all time, by the way. And and actually, um, this is the perfect bridge to ask you exactly how you got into Unreal Tournament because you were you were a, a, a pro player as much as the word pro can mean in 1999, I guess, right? Yeah, exactly. I, I definitely I went to lands and I played the Euro Cup, uh, the clan base cups, and and stuff like that. So I was playing competitively, but I. Obviously, by then it wasn't as pro as things are now. Um, I always grew up playing a lot of video games, and in school I didn't have that many friends particularly, but I had one who said, "Here's a it was a CD-ROM then a CD-ROM of Unreal Tournament. Do you want to give it a try?" And I was like, "Yes, of course." So I gave it a try. I played in the offline mode, and I just loved it. But I fell more in love with it when I discovered that you could go online and you're playing against real people, and uh, I spent so much time on that game. My life was really school, homework, unreal, <laughs> school, homework, unreal. Um, sometimes maybe not to the pleasure of my mother, but uh, yeah, it was just the way it was. Wow, that's, um, that's, that's an interesting combination. For me, it was very similar, except without the school and the homework part. <laughs> <laughs> now, I was goody two shoes. You, oh, you're a good one. Okay, okay. Well, fair enough. That's an example to all you kids out there, okay? You do have to do your homework and go to school if you want to host uh, EU LCS. Yeah, or if you want to go pro. <laughs> exactly. Uh, now, you did mention uh, Euro Cups just now, and you've said in previous interviews that you had, you had won this with Team Belgium. Uh, I believe. Can you talk a little bit about that? Like, what was the first one you won? You, I think you, you're, you're a champion of multiple Euro Cups, right? Uh, well, I was never a champion of the Euro Cup. We were a champion of the Nations Cup with Team Belgium. For some reason, Belgium had an extreme amount of very good ICTF um, players. I also don't know why that is, because it's not like we're really good at anything else sports-wise necessarily uh, or competitively. So in the Nations Cup, Belgium would win. And actually in the Euro Cups and on the LAN parties I played, my team would always come in second to a team called Majestic 5. We would be in Prepare for Your Doom, and it was kind of a rivalry. And honestly, they were much better than us. But a lot of the members of Majestic 5s were, were Belgium, and then we played together in the Nations Cup. I guess you could compare it to you know, football or, or soccer, as you guys call it, I guess, uh, where you play in your respective teams with all nationalities, and then you play together to play the World Cup or then the Nations Cup. 
and conquer all the other nations, which is what we did. I'm glad that you told me what uh, PFYD stands for, because I have been trying to figure that out for about a week and a half while writing, <laughs> while writing about you. And it's been uh, it's been complicated. There's not a lot of UT information left on the Internet. No, there's not a lot left. I actually recently tried to look up some stuff. But um, yeah, it's ancient history. You know, it's uh, so 1999. It's wow. It came out 20 years ago. <laughs> Jeez. I uh, I want to ask you moving moving on a little bit from internet tournament. I, I've been obviously writing about uh, the script about you and, and about your life, and I was reading a lot of old interviews. And uh, there was there's a part that you bring up where you're uh, like in, in in a couple interviews I saw where you were kind of finishing up university. You had done you know th uh, an extra two two terms for three degrees, and you kind of there was there was something in there about like not knowing where to go. And I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about about that like did you know what you wanted to do or were you just like totally lost at that point um yeah i think this is something that probably a lot of people who finish university or college of kind of anything they did after high school can relate to the fact that you like you're in the system where it's all about studying getting your grades but you also have relative freedom you know you get to kind of plan your own time and then when that's over you know okay it's time for the next part of my life uh am i gonna be a nine to five person am I gonna have kids and you know I don't know live remotely and and just do my job and then I'll retire and all those thoughts were just in my head of like is this for me what do I want to do what have I really achieved in my life and when I think uh, it comes to things that I found out whilst I was studying uh, so I studied history and after that I studied journalism as well and as I did more of that I realized that I actually really wanted to be a reporter for competition mainly football is what I was interested in tennis and cycling and when I graduated I was afraid to take that step honestly I was like okay this is so intimidating and, and glooming and like how am I ever going to get into this business that is so established and people are already in um, so then I took the turn to realizing that I could do the same thing but for the comp competition of esports I completely by accident tuned into a twitch broadcast um i had started playing league of legends a couple of months before and then i was like well I, I could do this i can do this and maybe this is my start can you tell me a little bit about that uh first match of league you watched i think you mentioned somewhere it was, it was iem season six was it a moscow five match who do you remember at all who you were watching i don't remember too much uh, i believe it was uh intel extreme masters 2000 12 or 2011 must have been 2012 and it's in Hanover and um, I think it was counter logic gaming but it was like hotshot GG and st. vicious and all those people so really like old school and don't remember too much I also remember that I then always used to lay in bed and watch the um, OGN broadcast so the Korean broadcast because well the English uh, broadcast of Korean because then teams went over teams were still able to go over and play in Korea and CLG did just that and they would be streaming from Korea or they would be playing and I remember watching a lot of that in my first couple of you know d discovery steps of competitive league can you tell me a little bit more about what you thought about league kind of in your early days I know you mentioned that you mentioned in another interview that uh, one of your old clan mates got you into it but kind of what what was your experience with League of Legends like back then um, well, in general, I, I was always uh, I'm always been open to trying a lot of different games growing up. I played Tomb Raider, I played Unreal, I played racing games um, and stuff like that. But I'd never really played a MOBA. And one of my old clanmates he said, "This is free. You should try it. It's fun." And I basically was really attracted to the fact that it was just really fun. It it was a really good game to play with five people to be on Teamspeak, and you know it was a learning curve. I was really bad. I mean, I've never really been great at League of Legends, but it was just so incredibly fun. And then I, when I tuned into the broadcast, I also saw, well, actually, it's not just fun. There's also people that are extremely good at it and who get to play in front of then hundreds of people and win cash prizes and who are really invested in their craft. So, yeah, for me, it took a couple of months, but I became really obsessed with it. And then obviously you got into doing you know content and stuff with it with uh, with SK and then some with Summoners Recap and other stuff. Can you can you tell me about that process? Because obviously you were coming from this background of wanting to do broadcast for for sports and what like did that stuff translate over? Was it just like a natural progression for you to go? Oh hey, somebody should be doing this, but for esports. Um, well. Mainly, uh, I when it comes to broadcasting, I actually wanted to do writing. Mainly, uh, I was I'd never really thought about the fact of being in front of a camera or being visible at all. And when I applied to SK Gaming, I would do a lot of writing. I would uh, write like op-ed pieces and longer form, like you know, criticism of the league and why 
you know, why people were subbing in and subbing people out all the time and how it wasn't helping the scene as well as clan news, you know, uh, X has joined this team, there was the roster shuffle, the curse, the famous curse CLG boy boy roster shuffle, things like this. Um, they were very happy with my work and I actually climbed up to be our editor in chief. So I would be looking over all the other esports, all the other esports writing that would come out and try and like delegate and coordinate and stuff like that. Uh, and at a certain point, Alex from SKE said, well, you know, would you like to be on camera? And I said, no, I like, I have no idea. I would not like to do that. I have no idea. And he just said, well, I would like you to try it. We can send you to an event. Um, actually, DreamHack is coming up and we would like to send you with a camera and a mic and do your thing. And I just said, why not? Let's do it. And that's how I got to do my first things on camera. Right, and and there's I I remember seeing in, in one of the other interviews I read that you were talking about how there was a lot of pressure on you to get a, like a quote unquote real job, right? Where yeah. you were you were doing this, and you mentioned that your parents and the government were were that. What was what? Can you describe that in more de detail? Like, what was the feeling like? Was it like, oh, I'm gonna have to stop doing this eventually and get like you know a real journalism job or a real you know a teaching gig or or something? Oh, exactly that. Um, so what my life would look like is I moved back into my, not my dorm, but like a student flat kind of because it was much cheaper, even though I wasn't a student anymore. And um, I, of course, I was starting out and I wouldn't get paid that much, um, but I would get to travel a lot. So what it would look like is, for instance, I would uh, waitress on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I would step on a plane to Las Vegas to cover IPL Friday, Saturday, Sunday, fly back on Monday and Tuesday afternoon I'd be waitressing again um, to make ends meet. So obviously after a couple of months I was like, damn, I need like a steady job. And on top of that, the Belgian employment agency kept hassling me and was like, you need to get a real job. You have a master's degree for freak's sake. Like, what are you doing? And I was like, but this, this is what I want to do. Like, you guys don't understand. This is esports. It's amazing. It's gonna explode. I love do, I love covering it. I get to travel. It's great. And they said that's all good and well, but it's not a real job. And they were right in essence, right? Because I was like in that hybrid between being a student and between being a freelancer, and and there wasn't really a lookout to a steady job. So things were getting things were getting quite difficult. I knew I had to make a decision, or I had to find a job, or I have to quit and leave everything behind. That, yeah, that, I think I feel like that was a, a relatively common thing for a lot of people juggling so many stuff back then, right? Was it difficult to try to explain to like even your even your family that like, hey, I, I'm doing esports and this is a really big deal to me and I think it's going somewhere? Yeah, it was super difficult. I think all of us um, and you guys probably can just identify with the fact that it's much easier to explain things now when you have examples of things going on in stadiums and everything being much more professional. But back then it was like, oh, I need a passport. I'm going to Korea. I'm going to cover this tournament mom. And she's like, what video games? And like, is this, you know, connected to this unreal tournament you used to play? And what's up with that? My mom would be supportive as much as she could, but she's still a mom. So she'd be like, okay, I want you to take these chances, but know that after a couple of months, we're just gonna sit down and see then what you're actually going to do. So I I can't blame anyone for that because um, it did seem like a huge risk, but you know, I was onto something, I felt it, and I wasn't gonna let it go. That makes sense. Listen, it's still difficult sometimes. I got this job three years ago and I still have to sometimes explain to my dad that like, hey, esports is real and it's paying my rent. Trust me, don't worry about it. <laughs> Uh, I think the main thing they, they worry about is like, is it paying your rent is like the main thing. Are you are you getting paid, uh, which is a good thing to go by. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to ask about you, you mentioned before about, you know, doing on camera stuff. I think eventually after doing so much stuff with with SK and Cyber Sports Network, uh, there's an interview I found where you talked about kind of ESL approaching you at a I think at an Intel Extreme Masters or, or, or an event like that and asking you to do a camera test. And this ended up being like an audition for ULCS. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Because that seems kind of crazy that you just get pulled from like hanging out in an event being like, hey, be on camera, we're going to audition you. Yeah, um, that's funny you mentioned that. I never really thought back about that uh, in like the last couple of years. But yeah, what happened is I was doing all this content and I was like a one man show. Um, and it was actually how things were done. Rachel at Cyber Sports Network Seltzer, uh, who is obviously a very accomplished broadcaster, te uh, taught me a lot of things and we were all just kind of we did the interview, then we went to the hotel room, we edited in Premiere, and we shipped it to YouTube, and the next thing, and all that stuff was going on, and that, that was the same way uh, at which I covered an ESL event, an IEM in the Cologne Studios, and I was just doing a lot of interviews, and since not that many people were doing interviews, they were getting a lot of traction. 
So at one point I was approached uh, by one of the higher ups or people involved in the broadcasting at ESL and they just said, you know, do you want to do this? I believe it was a fan interview or like a fan check in. And then that kind of qualified as a sort of a first step or audition. But I wouldn't say I completely didn't realize it. I definitely just kind of realized it, but I wasn't that savvy in like business wise and what they were trying to do. So I just did a good job apparently. And that gave, came back to me later on. Makes sense. I obviously, you know, then you did the OSS and you've been with Riot for a long time now doing LCS broadcast for a long time. I, I want to talk about that. Something that's interesting is you've talked in the past about the importance of having kind of these more personal relationship with the players and, and getting to know them and, and, and kind of understanding them. I want to know how those kinds of relationships come about because you've talked about how it's it's helpful for, you know, the post game interviews and even interacting with, with people on the desk, just being able to have these relationships with them. I just want to know how yeah. you go about like developing those. Um, I would say that um, when I say like good relationships with the, the players, I don't mean like, oh, we're best friends, you know, and stuff like that necessarily. But I think because of the tradition of EU LCS using a lot of players on broadcast and the fact that we saw each other very often and actually we saw each other the whole year, you get to live through a lot with uh, these guys. You know, you see whenever they win or lose, you, you can talk to them, you ask them sometimes behind the scenes how they're doing and if they're all right. And you discover more and more step by step, but it is really a year long process. Um, and it, it took several years for me to get very comfortable with people in general. But the fact that you just see them and you can talk to them about a lot of things makes you uh, be able to break down a bit more boundaries when it comes to on air on air interviews. You know, you talk beforehand, you have an OK relationship. So you can ask them, is there anything you know, I can't ask you about and actually I would love to ask you about this and I know you're not that comfortable with it, but I think it would be good for you to talk about it. And throughout the years, um, there have also been just since things have professionalized, there's been a lot of sessions with the players, um, interview, like kind of coaching and uh, media awareness and all that through Riot, which allowed us to build up a, he a heavier or bigger relationship, a professional relationship with the players, which has been good. What about with with new talent and, and new players? Because I feel like we've seen we've seen obviously a lot of new players come into Europe this year because of a lot of people going out to to NA. But generally, we've also seen a lot of new talent come in. And I'm wondering because these have to be people who were league fans who have been watching you for for several years. Is it weird at all interacting with these people who essentially look up to you and, and now get you know are, are working under you or with you? Um, I don't think it uh, it happens that often that they are really starstruck by me or maybe I'm just. I don't know. It's not false modesty. I just really don't know or don't think so. Uh, but I do think that, you know, it is weird that these are sometimes guys that are like 17 years old. They watch the broadcast for three, four years and now they're like on TV, you know, for real. Um, but I think because now I've arrived at a point that I've been able to talk to so many people, I'm very comfortable in those situations. I almost have like a non, I, I, like awkwardness does not really affect me or people who are just like trying to come into our home. And I always remember that it's not about me. If I look silly, so be it. Uh, but I want these guys to look good. So I try to make them as comfortable as possible. And I think that I've gotten pretty good at kind of body language and um, like radiating maybe calmness if they need it in that moment and be sure the, that to not throw them in front of the wolves in the end. Yeah, it makes sense. I have to imagine that a lot of those players probably appreciate that because a lot of them haven't ever had to do something like this before and, and having somebody who's experienced kind of leading them through it a little bit is, is helpful. I have one last question about the past before I take before we, we finally get <laughs> to the present. And I want to ask just kind of generally um, what your personal kind of favorite moment you've been a part of as, as part of the EULCS broadcast or, or just riot broadcasting. Like if there's a favorite moment you have that you've gotten to, to do. Um, well, uh, this this is not a surprise, but when we did Worlds in 2015 and we went to Paris, uh, Dyrus retired, you know, the longtime TSM stalwart in the top lane who I think was one of our biggest uh, League of Legends like stars of all time, when, if we're ever going to look back at that. And he um, retired, they weren't able to qualify, and it was just a very, very emotional moment. And for me, it was really a... Um, and I don't want to take anything away from that moment in Dyrus the way it was, but it was definitely also a very important career moment for me. It's when I also got a bit of recognition for being able to kind of gel in, in all circumstances uh, because of the way I handled that interview. And it just as a fan, because people often forget that we are still fans, you know, we're viewers. It was 
awesome to be a part of, you know, this guy who has an absolute huge legacy, who is just opening up and, and, and at the big, biggest stage that exists for League of Legends is absolutely wonderful. Now, Shox, uh, Dan said that uh, we'd be going to the present and not returning to the past anymore, but he is fake news because okay. I, I, I actually wanted to ask, uh, put you on the spot a little bit here and, and just see if, if you could share with us, I don't know, your favorite esports story from the past. It could be a crazy, insane, you know, 25 hour day that you worked. It could be your first ever broadcast for EU LCS. It could be something crazy that happened backstage with the players. Um, but just anything that, that comes to mind as like, wow, that was a that was an insane uh, moment or time. Oh, that is crazy. Uh, that's really difficult. I think um, you put me on the spot, so I'm going to pick a couple of moments since we have a bit of time. Uh, you mentioned the first LCS broadcast. Of course, that's always going to be monumental for me. Um, it was the first time I ever read off a teleprompter. So it's where literally the script or whatever or what you've prepared is on. And I was absolutely disastrous um but i immediately had a big shot producer from north american lcs ariel horn uh, came up and he was just like that was shit you know <laughs> that was really bad um but gave me some constructive feedback and he said we're going to get through this we're going to take this one step at a time and that was a great start for me i think when we look at league history and players and stuff there are a couple of moments that stand out um, i have a bit of recency bias because so much awesome stuff happens all the time a couple of things that i remember is um msi 2015 in tallahassee florida of all places where Fnatic had an amazing run but at the end uh we saw edg being victorious over skt with pawn picking the morgana as a counter to fakers leblanc in game five that was like uh, that was crazy that was incredible i think most recently um the fact that rng was able to win an msi and it's funny because when i come back to it we've had so much korean dominance and skt dominance for a very long time so uh those upset moments for me are always yeah they, they stick with me um but you know there's so many eras and i think it's crazy that we we're like seeing eras you know you have the g2 era in europe you had the skt era internationally are we going into the new era of, of chinese domination what is europe gonna do and all the upset throughout the years all stick with me um it's very hard to pick one now i realize that but thank you for the question of course i think i think you did well there as you said we we definitely put you on the spot what about um what about like a like a crazy broadcast day because i as as you well know uh, you know when you're when you're doing either live or or pre taped TV, nothing ever goes according to plan. I get the sense that the ULCS is actually a very well oiled machine, but now, sh now exactly. But surely there must have been a time where everything that could go wrong did go wrong, and you guys weren't even sure that you were going to make it on onto the air. Oh yeah, that that happened many times. I think definitely in the early days, and I mean, not gonna lie, also just recently, uh, some days of the EU LCS and internationally. Um, one thing that I wasn't part of, but I was a freelancer at the site, was at the season two World Championships. Um, if you guys remember, there was like a ten-hour pause. D Man yes. and Jack were filling, and it was outside at LA Live, so it was absolutely boiling, and they had to fill for ten hours. And often when I hear about people, they're like, "Oh my God, you know." Season two and season three was the best thing ever. And I was like, D do you guys, <laughs> did you guys not remember how bad things got? Um, but, you know, I also agree that th those times were really awesome. But really weird things happened in the EULCS studio in Cologne. It was really, it gets really hot in uh, Cologne in summer. And I remember, I believe Joe and D-Man were casting. And during a live cast, the air conditioning broke and splashed water over them. In the middle of the cast, nobody ever heard it, I don't think. And I think it was Trevor Quickshot who then went into the room and put buckets down, like tried to dry them off in the middle of everything. There was another day where um, the broadcast, there were some technical difficulties, I believe, in a promotion tournament, and we had to move everything to the next day, which is like, that's the worst thing that can ever happen. But, you know, we always got through it and we always kept going. So uh, I think we deserve a bit of praise for that and especially the production crew as well. And I'm definitely happy that things are less of the wild, wild west now and they are more regulated. Some people say it takes away some of the fun, but like you want the broadcast to continue, you know, like you never want anything to 
disrupt the game so that it can't go on. And I'm happy we're past that. Wow, that that air conditioning story is nuts. Um, yeah. Also, guys, on this Scory Sports podcast, I'd like to resolve now that we never take a 10-hour pause if we can avoid it. Let's just <laughs> please not do that. Um, but Sean Wetzlar, you haven't said a damn word during this yes, entire time, sorry. and I feel bad, so I'm going to cede the floor to you. Sure, sure. Yeah, let's, uh, I think, take it back to the to the present, finally. If okay, you go ahead and do that. They, we've been promising to do that for 20 minutes, so. That's true. <laughs> Um, I, I think uh, to start, I think we got to ask um, about what sort of the talk of the town has been lately, which is um, obviously the uh, English language broadcast for Worlds and uh, sort of the decision to uh, do most of the broadcast from the Los Angeles studio uh, with yourself and with Avali sort of on the ground in Korea doing interviews. I know you've been pretty outspoken on social media that maybe the community's sort of knee jerk reaction wasn't. Uh, what, what, what wasn't wasn't quite right, and that there's a lot of advantages to, to broadcasting from from LA. So, can you maybe just just share your thoughts on on the decision to to go that way this year? Um, yeah. Um, well, I obviously don't have that much insight into. I'm not you know a part of the people that make the decision, but I definitely have a lot of information as to how broadcasts work remotely and why it has advantages. Now, it's hard for me to say any kind of positive thing because then I immediately a riot chill or whatever, but it's just the way it is. This is how I feel about it. Um, I have to say, first up, um, we used to broadcast the analyst desk from the LA studio uh, for a long time and then would only come on site for the finals. It was the case, for instance, in Korea in 2014. Um, and then we moved everything to being on the live location. But the fact of the matter is also that there have been so much investments in making those studios respectively around the world. And then in this case in LA, insanely equipped with the telestrator and the control room and, you know, everything so that you can make the best possible show with the best possible graphics, the best possible AR and everything. So I think in one sense, it does make sense to have at least the analyst desk in that location because um, it, when you think about what the analyst has to do, it, it, it sets up the stories and the narrative, it follows the teams and then it has the post-game analysis. So you need as many tools as possible to do that in the best way. And then I think it's not that far-fetched to do that from a studio that has all those capabilities. Like, I, I think that makes sense. On the other hand, I do understand the community gripe of like, well, we want our casters to be on location and we want them to kind of feel the room. And I agree as a viewer and, and as someone who's worked these events, I definitely also feel that. But if the positivity of doing it and creating the best content in that studio outweighs that, then that's just a choice I think Riot has to make and that's why they are doing it now and, and trying it now. When it comes to the casters not being on location, that I'm not completely sure about. Um, a lot of casters I know from personal experience like the Fisho and Quickshot who I've talked to have said, for us it doesn't make the biggest difference. It does as the fact that I'm a fan and I want to be on location. But from a technical standpoint, the fact that I get pure audio and I'm not being distracted by anything and I can really zone in and look at the screen, which is in the end also what we're doing, um, should make for a good product. Uh, that doesn't mean that it will work that way for everyone. You know, I'm not a shoutcaster per se. I'm an uh, interviewer and a host. So for the host part, analyst desk wise, I can definitely see why you would want to do it in a studio that has everything. As a caster not being on site, I'm not entirely sure, but hopefully we'll see now. And um, I am confident that then the right decisions and right conclusions will be made. I get it from a viewer perspective and from a fan perspective. Um, I get it, but I hope that they can also think about the fact that it, it might be a really, it, it's still going to be a really good product, you know. And when it gets compared to a lot of other broadcasts that are always only remotely like most recently the international and stuff international was freaking amazing but um you know they invest everything into having that studio there at that time for this amazing freaking event and they don't have another studio or two or three around the world that are completely equipped and that have been invested in for many 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 years so i think they're different cases and the community should probably look a case by case by case, by case basis as well but i think at the end, if they come out and they're like, we thought it was awful and, you know, it didn't work, <laughs> fair enough, I guess, right? Um, but let's not judge it before it is done and we will definitely all do our best to make it a great experience for the viewers at home. Sure, definitely. 
Um, and I guess, can you talk also a little bit about sort of what your role in this whole process will be as one of those like two main uh, English uh, voices um, on the ground in Korea? I think the only information we have is that you and Avali will be rotating throughout uh, the lead up to, to finals. So will you be in Korea for the for the entirety of the event? And, and can you tell us anything about sort of how uh, that part of the process is going to work? Yeah, um, I can't give you too much information as to lock down kind of talent rotation and stuff like that because they haven't been super pinned down. There may even be, um, you know, maybe there's a chance that I have some other roles as well. But as it looks like now, we will be the main communicators on site for most of it. Uh, and to be honest, for us, that is not entirely different from what we've done in the past. Last year, I did the MSI planes in Brazil, and I was the only person on the ground. And that means the only person from like our casters, but there's people there, you know, there's broadcasters, there are local broadcasters, um, player management, the players themselves, or a riot team on the ground. So when it comes to that, I'm not that worried. In the end, at the end of the day, we're doing our jobs and we're set in a position we're set up for success to do that. And when the show goes on, you don't really notice that much of anything else. And uh, I'll have Avali, so we'll be able to go have lunch together and have dinner together and all that and explore hopefully a, a little bit. And there's many other people there that can do that as well. I don't think, for me, it won't make that much of a difference. I, me and Avali will still be bringing you the player reactions firsthand, which is what we need and is kind of the only thing you cannot do remotely. So yeah. Okay, awesome. Well, I think that I think that helps a lot. Um, so I guess I, I want to take things sort of to uh, the, the the EU LCS broadcast as a as a whole because you know you've talked a lot about uh, the investment that's been put into this studio and sort of uh, you know your 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 personal growth as a broadcaster. But can you can you share a little bit what it's been like seeing the the EU LCS sort of evolve from its from its early days to what it is now? Um, my sense is that like as a broadcast team. You guys have always been willing to sort of try new stuff, to go with different formats, to really uh, experiment a little with the broadcast, and uh, and it seems like it's 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 worked well for you. So so can you can you talk a little bit about just uh, you know seeing the ULCS broadcast team specifically like grow from those from those early broadcasts, from learning to read the teleprompter and and all of that to kind of the as Colin put it that well-oiled machine that we that we see on the air today. Yeah, uh, I think. With everything going that well this year, um, you know, people, I know they don't forget because they remind us, but things have not always been that good. And I also think that's kind of fair, but I hope that people can also see that it's been kind of a long process. As you said, we have been also the uh, squad that has innovated and tried new things, and sometimes they really didn't work out. You know, the double stream best of twos were, I think, the most hated format the community had ever seen. And I think. When you look back at it, that was a combination of factors. And I think what's in, what's important to know is that we started from being kind of a mirror and a twin of the NALCS. You know, everything was just starting out, and the idea was just to have a weekly league, to have them run simultaneously. And they there wasn't that much room for innovation because it was kind of the first step. So everything was the same, and we were often dubbed as the little sister or the little brother of the NALCS, which I think was fair. Um, we started from the ESL studio and broadcast, and then the decision was made to move the studio to Berlin. So you have to know that then in 2014, everything started from zero again because the new studio had to be built. So that meant that all new people had to be hired and had to be found, um, and it would be a step-by-step -step gradual process. And that is where we got the most backlash from the community because for what all they could see, the product was inferior because you know, and behind the scenes, we knew, well, it's because the studio just moved and a lot of the show was actually still being produced from the L.A. studio with people from L.A. who were then working at 3 a.m. and at, you know, graveyard shifts to help us out because we were still building the new studio and we were still hiring new people. And I think, you know, from a community, you just looked at, well, it's worse, you know, like the graphics worse, um, the talent's worse, it just the, the, the product isn't as polished. And we knew that, but it was like really hard to be honest about why that was because I think when things aren't perfect and when things are, are bad, you can't just say, you know, at, well, it's because this and the studio situation, this and this, because it just sounds like an excuse. The only choice you really have is to keep grinding and to keep working. So we took that in stride and more things fell in place. You know, we found more of our own casters, individual casters. Quick Shot became a wonderful play by play. We uh, opened up the crew. We have like Vettius and Medic now and Dracos and all these other people and Pyra. Deficio came into his own and kind of over the years established 
established himself as one of the best casters, if not the best color caster, a lot of times at international events. The behind the scenes, we got our own control room that was now filled with all of our own people that were hired over the years. The player rooms got upgraded. And then finally this year, in front of the screen, everything upgraded. The final step was that the analyst desk step was revamped. And as a combination with that, before this season, we all sat together with the producers and we were like, listen, we need to give our viewers what they really want. We need to stop doing them at the surface. Now everything is in place. We need to go ham. You know, how are we going to do that? And we put structures in place as to how we would approach our work week and our building up of narratives, what tools we had at our disposal, how we should push things through. And maybe you guys know this, but we overdid it a couple of times. We had Fnatic called the new kings and the legacy a bit too much. But that was also a sign of the fact that our narrative building was working and the fact that we made specific videos and segments with the players and the graphics and uh, the replays to support them, it was all working out. So I think this year has been a culmination of things that have built up behind the stream, behind the stream for a very, very long time and where we can finally and definitively say that EULCS has a different identity from NALCS and that's fine. You know, we have different styles of broadcasts and that's fine. So that makes me really happy. I definitely remember, you know, even like in the office, people were talking about like, you know, the ELCS being the younger sibling. And, and it's really interesting because I think uh, Sean and I were talking the other day when we were, we were putting together questions. We were, we were talking about how we felt like the ELCS broadcast, particularly this year, is really strong, but kind of historically has been really interesting. And, and something I want to ask about is, is you brought up the younger sibling thing, the, you know, you guys always experimenting. I think from the outside looking in, it always felt like you guys were were the guinea pig. But now, but what it sounds like to me is that you guys are just really proud of of being the you know the the standard bearer. I guess is that is that correct? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, it. I, I'm not gonna lie. Sometimes it also felt like we were a bit of the guinea pig. But what people have to know is that, no, like, those are always decisions that are made with two teams together who at that point thought it was the best course of action and. Once you make a decision, you have to stick to it. So we're not going to like halfway through the season be like, all right, well, double streams didn't work out. Let's just call it a day. That's not how it works. You know, when you're in it and when you're trying it, you have to see it out to the end. And sometimes it didn't work out. And, you know, you learn from those mistakes and you keep going. Um, so I am very proud of that. And I also am very proud of the fact that we always stuck to being a broadcast that was more rooted in European sports tradition, where I think the American broadcast is one that is more rooted in American sports tradition, ESPN style and whatnot. Uh, and it didn't always work out for us because I do think that people also really like, you know, full structure and everything and the way NALCS likes to do things. And I agree. But now I think it's showing that we can also do that. And the fact that we have a different style, which sometimes is a bit more focused on like pundits and banter and, and letting things run loose a little bit doesn't mean that we also do not have structure because we do. We have just as much structure. We have just as much preparation. I prepare just as much. I know exactly where everything is going, but sometimes I do like to let things run loose a little bit, you know, and then see what the players say or what they come up with and give them agency because why not? And then, yeah, well, maybe we have to drop a graphic because that wasn't the way we prepared it. But if it makes for a better show, I'm fine with it. Personally, as a, as a viewer of the LCS and as someone who sometimes is, you know, watching all the games on the weekend, whether it be EU or NA, um, I desperately appreciate the fact that each broadcast is colored differently and they are not, there isn't a homogenous um, sort of uh, a palette to it uh, because it, it, it really would just sort of blend together a, a bit too much for me. Now, you said much earlier on in our conversation uh, when you were talking about the past shocks that, you know, you had this feeling when you were first getting into esports that, hey, this is going somewhere. There is a future in this. I will um, go to events and then waitress on the side until this pans out for me. In terms of League of Legends specifically, with everything that's happened in the last year or two with franchising, um, coming to some leagues, do you still feel that way that there is a future and that League of Legends is still climbing upwards? Um, well, when it comes to if I can only look inside my own like viewpoint of ULCS, definitely yes, because things have looked more positive this year than they have in the past. Plus, we have permanent partnerships, uh, AK franchising on the horizon. Um, I do think in general you feel that 
you need to put in more than you used to. I think we have definitely left a time where everything was like, it was growing no matter what you did, you know, and everyone was playing league and everyone was watching league because there was not that much else. And, you know, and now you definitely realize that, you know, there are a lot of other games that are very, very successful and that do a production really well. Overwatch League uh, launched this year and was freaking great. You know, they had some amazing casters, amazing production, some great hype for their first year. Counter-Strike has always been knocking it out of the park. The International had one of their best events ever with also a great storyline. Fortnite is is doing events. I wouldn't say that it's yet like the blown up esports, but they're definitely also doing competitive events. And there's just so much more for people to watch, which is something that as a broadcaster is the main thing that I'm looking at uh, because I can't really know how many people are playing or are picking up playing um, necessarily. But I do feel that it's it's become harder to distinguish yourself. But in a way, that's also a good thing. I take that in stride and I think that's a wonderful challenge to have. And I wish you know, more people would just see it as, as a good thing for the involvement of the scene because if League of Legends necessarily isn't growing as explosively anymore, esports definitely is. And uh, right now it's Fortnite's time and I really appreciate the fact that they like they have broken a lot of barriers down with the way they've approached uh, coming into mainstream media. Uh, and I think that can only be a good thing for everyone. Fair enough. Fair enough. Now, now speaking of those other uh, esports and, and their own broadcast successes, would you ever consider in a hypothetical future um, moving to one of those doing Counter-Strike interviews and hosting? Um, well, I've thought about this a lot, and I think a lot of specific esports broadcasting is like you compare it to a commentator for, let's say, American football or whatever. He's not just going to jump to another sport necessarily or not without a lot of preparation. So I think esports is a bit different in that it is definitely possible, but it is quite difficult because you are so ingrained in a scene and you know so much about the history, and that's not just something you pick up. But I do think it's possible. I have. Uh, many people I look up to, for instance, Machine, who successfully covered the international as well as Counter-Strike events to a super high level. Of course, Monte Cristo and Doha, who made the jump from League of Legends to Overwatch. Uh, I don't know what's in store for me. Um, I, I do have to say sometimes, you know, I've been doing this for seven years and only this. So sometimes I wonder, wow, you know, what would it be like to do one of these other events? Um, but not right now. But I don't know. Why not? I also often definitely think about um you know i still love football or then soccer uh, i just watched the world cup and i was just enthralled and there's still this kind of inkling of damn you know uh, do i want to pursue that again do i want to do that again so who knows and also shocks hey who knows unreal tournament can always make a comeback right yeah, I mean, Fortnite is also from Epic Games and it's doing extremely well. <laughs> so I think they kind of have their hands full, but I wish, uh, you know, that would be like the only thing ever that would make me say, I'm sorry, League, uh, I need to try this. Uh, unfortunately, I do not think it's the case, but who knows? Uh, unfortunately, I think you're correct in that. Um, Shox, as we uh, begin to wind this conversation down, I just wanted to open the floor to you again. Um, for you to be able to sort of make any final statements, bring up any topics that we never prompted you on, or just even um, give a shout out to, to all the fans out there. Uh, so uh, the floor is yours, basically. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, um, I'd have to thank everyone for their support this year. Um, I personally had a, ha are having, I'm having, English is sometimes hard, um, a really good year. And I want to thank everyone for sticking by me. Um, I didn't have the best year last year and community was definitely also not too nice on me. But um, I feel like I've really been able to come into my own this year and really put my stamp on the segments that we've made in EULCS. In general, uh, sometimes it is hard to be an EULCS broadcaster. I think it's natural that people are very judgmental of everything you do and critical. And I also think it's a good thing. I just wish sometimes they would kind of look at different viewpoints. Um, but that's also the joy of the community, I guess. And I hope they watch the world's broadcast and give it a fair chance um, with the way things are being set up now. Uh, we're definitely going to knock it out of the park as a team. And we hope it's a great viewer experience. Oh, well said. And, and we look forward to, uh, to watching you in Madrid and beyond at Worlds. Um, thank you so much, Shox, for making time for the Scory Sports Podcast. It really has been a pleasure speaking with you today. Uh, thank you. You guys uh, were very prepared. It was really awesome talking to you guys.
Oh, thank you so much. Take care and uh, have a nice flight. Will do. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Oh, that was a lovely interview, guys. Yeah, absolutely. I, I really, really enjoyed that. I definitely feel uh, I, I, I wasn't realizing because I've been writing about chalk, like writing mm -hmm. this script about chalks for for about you know the the week and a half, two weeks that I was going through it and doing all my research, mm -hmm. and and then I it kind of took me a second as she was talking, like I also have a. Uh, a weird useless master's degree and I also wanted to write and I'm also doing video now and wow that's this is strange yeah I mean uh, common threads in esports for sure yeah I definitely um, think there's some some universal themes there that we can all relate to uh, I don't know if uh, explaining things to our parents has ever gotten a whole lot simpler even with the uh growth of esports yeah i definitely still get linked um bbc articles from my dad uh that's like oh this new video game it's like that's that's close dad yeah assassin's creed that's totally what i do yeah no, i can't it. wait so what you're saying is assassin's creed esports then ut that no, was no. unreal uh, what, what is oh, there's no unreal, new unreal tournament there's unreal just... is going to be the next big esport forget fortnite epic games please write the ship turn it around we'll do it shocks will host it did we'll ever, cover it did i ever tell you colin about unreal or tournament Unrealer? No, uh, this is not. This is fake, right? No, no, no. This is real. So it's uh, it's it's a uh, it's a game in which you play Unreal Tournament, but you are also playing chess at the same time. And while your opponent is playing chess, they are hunting for you, like where you left your your character in in the map on Unreal. Why? Why? Okay, I, now I'm convinced this is fake. Why? No, it's 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 real. Okay. Anyway, Colin, take us out of this room. Yeah, this room is really hot, especially for early in the morning. Guys, I just want to say thank you so much to our guest, Shox. It was a pleasure having her on. It's so nice when uh, people that busy are able to make time in their in their tight schedules for us. Uh, I know I speak for Dan and Sean when I say it was a great conversation. Wish we had more time. But you know what? There can always be a next time. And until that next time, for Dan, for Sean, I'm Colin saying thank you so much for listening to the Scory Sports Podcast. GG.